this morning as we prepare to join together and worship the light and peace of Jesus Christ. May I be with you all this morning as we join and worship today the glory of the Lord that has been risen, has been given to us. Welcome to all who worship this morning. Welcome to those here, maybe for the first time or visiting many times. We thank you here we thank you for everybody watching at home. Welcome to worship this morning. Let's gather together and rejoice and sing of God's praise today and forevermore.
invite you to read with me our statement of faith this morning. From our world belongs to God, starting with number 55. Our hope for a new creation is not tied to what humans can do. For we believe that one day every challenge to God's rule will be crushed. His kingdom will fully come, and the Lord will rule. Come, Lord Jesus, come. We long for that day when our bodies are raised, the Lord wipes away our tears, and we dwell forever in guidance of God. We will take our place in the new creation, where there will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, and the Lord will be our light. Come, Lord Jesus, come. You may have a seat. As our usual method of operation this morning, the uh, offering will be collected as you either enter or exit this morning uh, from the sanctuary. We have a time of prayer, a time of conversation with our God, and a time of praising Him and thanking Him for the blessings we've been given, and, and of course, bringing our needs to Him. This morning, Vicki sent out an email. I don't know if everybody got a chance to see it. Last week, they took Don's feeding tube out for a test. They left it out, and he is doing tolerable with it, which is a good sign. He's not losing any weight, but he still doesn't have an appetite. But so far, everything's going good. They are waiting for a test. They found a tumor in his intestine that the doctor thinks might be the cause of the problem. So they're waiting for the test, and, and she says in the email, and, and again, you'll read it later, but they're very thankful that they have a doctor that's bent on solving the problem, not just covering the symptoms. So um, that's a good sign for them to be able to know that. So does anybody else have any other prayer requests this morning? So, My mom's cousin has COVID and it attacked his heart, so they're trying to figure out oh. if they need to do a transplant or if there's something else that they oh, can wow. do at that point. Okay. He's only 60. His name's Ron. Anybody else have any other prayer requests? Brenda. We should pray for Austin. He needs a pain being picked up. I think he thought, you know, after initially, you know, almost a year and a half ago, that it was more like it was never going to come when that time happened. And, and they came and said, no, it's time to go back to court. And he's really scared. Okay. Anybody else have any prayer requests? If anybody's watching at home, of course, on Facebook, if you have prayer requests, please mention them in the comments and we will get to them as well. Rhonda, did you see anything yet from there? No? Okay. Let's go to God in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for today. Each day is a day that you made and you give it to us so that we may live and be fruitful and do positive things in it, and, and you give us this responsibility to be stewards of your of your world and of your creation, and we thank you that as children of God, we have been given that responsibility. And we thank you that even though we fail sometimes, we're not good caretakers of the things you have blessed us with, that you forgive our sins, you pick us up, you clean us off, and you set us straight in the right direction to go. We have, and Father, we ask you for forgiveness of those sins, those times when we've fallen down and, and we have taken away the attention to your glory and, and let sin take over in our lives. And so we ask for those that forgiveness, dear Lord, and we recognize the salvation we have received from Jesus Christ on the cross. Dear Heavenly Father, we rejoice with the blessings you have given us. We rejoice with Don and Vicki, knowing that the feeding tube is out and his body's reaction to it has been tolerable, dear Lord. And we, we just ask for that appetite to return because 
a good fed and fueled machine will help fight off stuff. So we, we asked for an appetite to return and, and for results to come back from these blood tests and these, these workups that Don's had to go through so the doctor knows exactly what's going on and has a treatment and a care plan, dear Lord. Dear Lord, we pray for Sue's mom's cousin Ron, who was infected with COVID and it attacked his heart. And now we're we hear that he might have to have a heart transplant, and that's that's severe. We just ask for strength and, and curing and healing for him, and and this process if they have to go down the heart transplant way that it, it doesn't. It's not a labor lengthy process as some things like that may go. Dear Heavenly Father, we pray for Austin who has finally been located and arrested and is on his way back and that he gets a court date and, and that this court date is a jumping off point that he can use to re-guide his life towards you and not his own. And, and I know and, and many have heard that many times people and the justice system have to reach their lowest level before they can start building up. And we just ask for your guidance and your peace on Austin as he's waiting for this court day and, and, and that he can continue to focus on you after this. Dear Lord, we, we thank you that asking for focus from you is just as simple as asking for it. And then you give us that guidance and that focus and that leadership, dear Lord. So we ask you for leadership and guidance for the Christian Reformed Church around the world and for New Community Church of the Wago right here in our community that we have the leadership and the guidance to continue to hear your will clearer than anything else and respond with glorifying responsive service so that people know that the church is here as an extension of your love. And that we are here to bring people to that love. To our open doors of our church, to the way we act, to the way we live in life and, and respond to things, dear Lord. <coughs> Heavenly Father, we pray for a blessing on the rest of this church, dear Lord. And bless the technology and, and open our ears and our hearts to the scripture passage and the words of the message. We ask you to move the spirit to this place so that your lesson and your wisdom for us is heard. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Continue through the story of Joseph. Move on and we'll skip a couple chapters and we we'll pick back up on the Joseph story. We're going to be reading the 23 verses of chapter 39. And I was trying to figure out how to chop this up a little bit so we don't have to read 23 verses, but the writer of Genesis, the writer of the story, 
it's interesting if you stop at a paragraph there's still questions <laughs> so we're going to read all 23 we're going to trunch it on and, and and stick to it um it, it makes for a great story the way it's written and, and we get all the answers questions so to speak but Starting verse 1, chapter 39. Now Joseph had been taken down to Egypt. Potiphar, an Egyptian who was one of Pharaoh's officials, the captain of the guard, bought him from the Ishmaelites who had taken him there. The Lord was with Joseph. Remember that phrase in your head as we go on from here. The Lord was with Joseph so that he prospered and he lived in the house of his Egyptian master. When his master saw that the Lord was with him, and that the Lord gave him success in everything he did, Joseph found favor in his eyes, and he became his attendant. Potiphar put him in charge of his household, and he entrusted to his care everything he owned. From the time he put him in charge of his household and all of that he owned, the Lord blessed the household of the Egyptian because of Joseph. The blessing of the Lord was on everything that Potiphar had, both in the house and in the field. So Potiphar left everything he had in Joseph's care with Joseph in charge. He did not concern himself with anything except the food he ate. Now Joseph was well built and handsome, and after a while his master's wife took notice of him and said, come to bed with me. But he refused. With me in charge, he told her, my master does not concern himself with anything in the house. Everything he owns, he has entrusted in my care. No one is greater in his house than I am. My master has withheld nothing from me except you because you are his wife. So how then could I do such a wicked thing and sin against God? And though she spoke to Joseph day after day, he refused to go to bed with her or even be with her. One day he went into the house to attend to his duties and none of the household servants was inside. She caught him by his cloak and said, come to bed with me. But he left his cloak in her hand, and he ran out of the house. When she saw that he left his cloak in her hand, he had run out and run out of the house. She called her household servants. Look, she said to them, that Hebrew that has been brought to make has been brought to make it sport of us. He came in here to sleep with me, but I screamed. And when he heard me scream for help, he left his cloak beside me and ran out of the house. She kept his cloak beside her until the master came home. Then she told him this story: that Hebrew slave you brought us came to me to make sport of me, but as soon as I screamed for help, he left his cloak beside me and ran out of the house. When his master heard the story of his wife saying, this is how your slave treated me, he burned with anger. Joseph's master took him and put him in prison, the place where the king's prisoners were confined. But while Joseph was there in prison, the Lord was with him. He showed him kindness and granted him favor in the eyes of the prison warden. So the warden put Joseph in charge of all those held in prison, and he was made responsible for all that was done there. The warden paid no attention to anything under Joseph's care because the Lord was with Joseph, and he gave him success in whatever he had. This is the reading of God's word for this morning. I'm a history buff. I like history. I'm on the History Channel a lot. I was reading the other day about the Alamo. December 1835, during the early stages of the Texas War for Independence from Mexico, a group of Texan or Texians, volunteers led by General or George Collinsworth and Benjamin Millam, overwhelmed the Mexican garrison at the Alamo, which was also a mission and captured the fort, seizing control of San Antonio from Mexico. By mid-February of 1836, Colonel James Bowie, the guy famous for his knife, and Lieutenant Colonel William B. Travis had taken command of the Texan forces at the Alamo. The Alamo defenders, led by Bowie and his knife and Travis, dug in. They were prepared to fight for the altar, or for the altar. They were prepared to defend the fort to the bitter end. These defenders never numbered more than 200. In fact, there were several groups on their way that decided not to come because they heard, and this number will be astonishing, but they had Davy Crockett there, the famous frontiersman and former congressman from Tennessee who arrived. 
but that a Mexican force on February 23 comprising of somewhere between 1,800 and 6,000 men. Commanded by General Antonio Lopez de Santa Ana began a siege on the fort. This is what I'm saying. When they heard how many people were on the other side, they stopped at the border and said, I don't think we're going to do this. The Texans held out for 13 days, but on the morning of March 6, the Mexican forces broke through a breach in the outer wall of the courtyard and overwhelmed them. General Santa Ana ordered his men to take no prisoners, and only a small handful of Texans were spared. Talk about true strength under fire. As a, as a history buff, I also recommend going to your local library, checking out a book on the Alamo. You can also watch one of the two movies called the Alamo, 1960 version or the 2004 version. And as a history buff, you, you talk about strength under fire and, and, and standing and digging your ground. If you look at how the Alamo was laid out, it was no reason to be confused why the Mexican forces broke in because the breach in the courtyard was just an open area. And they basically just walked in. These guys had nothing to hide from. Cannonballs were crashing through the through the walls and going over the walls and breaking down buildings inside, stuff like that. They they had no they had no strength in, in their fort, but they had strength in their character. Like I said, I want to thank the History Channel for filling in the gaps that they didn't teach me in school. First time I learned that Davy Crockett died there, I was depressed for a week. Disney said he lived in Finland. Today we pick up, though, on another, to me, it's an exciting story about Joseph and his time. And there's a gap in this story. There's chapter 38 where we read about his brother Judah who did some sinning on his own. And, and then we pick up again back here on chapter 39 on Joseph. And we see that he finally made it to Egypt after his brothers sold him to the Ishmaelites. They were slave traders, for lack of a better term. And he was purchased by a high-ranking Egyptian official named Potiphar, who was the captain of the guard for the pharaoh at that time. Verse 2 of chapter 39 brings up a very important theme, and when I read it, this is, this is what I wanted you to remember. Verse 2 says that the Lord was with Joseph. If we were to put a theme on this chapter, I would say the Lord was with Joseph. Is probably the best thing that we could come up for. Even as an individual sold into slavery by his own family who wanted to kill him, or by his brothers who wanted to kill him first, on this trip to Egypt, Joseph was never alone. The scripture passage mentions that the Lord was in, with Joseph, those, those exact words, four times in this chapter. And you can actually find more times that it's mentioned or inferred, if you will. It just so happened that Joseph was owned and purchased by one of the more powerful people in Egypt besides the Pharaoh. Potiphar was the captain of the guard. He was most likely one of the bodyguards for the Pharaoh, or he was in charge of the bodyguards for the Pharaoh. He was a security official. And he took him in and and he made Joseph his household manager. Slaves in the, in the Old Testament, some of them were blessed enough to not live a slave's life as, as we may be used to. Some slaves were doctors and educators, household managers, business operators. And that's kind of what Joseph was. He was the household manager for the captain of the guard. Having that kind of character comes from having the Lord in your life. It means that you are noticed and, and maybe you get put in charge of many things. Like I said, it wasn't unusual for some slaves to be put in some higher positions. Joseph may have been a captive slave in Egypt in a foreign land, but he had this very important job and it was very well respected. He said to Potiphar's wife, nobody's bigger in this house than me which is a pretty big statement to make if your boss is in charge of security and the safety of the Pharaoh. But there Joseph was, 
doing his job and doing it well, like we know. Joseph didn't always have the easy life, though, in Potiphar's house. People that experience great success and prosperity often experience great tests. Where Joseph differed among the others, he also remained strong during adversity. He remained on his morals, if you will, stood a hard ground. I should also add that the book of Genesis says that Joseph was a strong, young, good-looking guy. That was more of a problem for him. The boss's wife, Mrs. Potiphar, as it says in the New King James Version, cast longing eyes upon him. Basically, she could see how good-looking and strong this guy was. This was also a bigger temptation for Joseph, among all of his other problems. He had this to deal with. Joseph could have gotten away with it, to be honest with you. We read in verses 2 through 5 that he was a great success at this job as a household manager because the Lord was with Joseph. And because the Lord was with Joseph, Potiphar was even successful, both in his house and at his job and at his home and in the field, it says. In his career, he was a successful captain of the guard. And it was because of Joseph's God. And Potiphar knew that it was because of Joseph's God. So Joseph even had more success, more success, and, and more responsibility given to him because Potiphar trusted this Hebrew, this God follower. And because of all this, Potiphar was a good boss, and he didn't micromanage Joseph either. He let him be. He let him just do the job. So when I say that Joseph could have gotten away with giving in to Mrs. Potiphar's advances, I mean it. First of all, like I said, Potiphar didn't concern himself with what Joseph was doing with the exception of what he ate. That verse is pretty curious in the, sub, in the, in the scripture passage. What that means, there's a couple of different things. It could have been because he knew he was Hebrew and he had dietary restrictions. So he had to make sure that Joseph was getting what he needed. If you're a respected household servant, you're going to want to be taken care of or you're going to want to take care of him. It could also mean that, you know, Joseph was still a slave. And so the only thing that Potiphar really concerned himself with is, well, wait, you're still my slave, even though you're really good, you're not going to eat at my table. You'll go, go sit where the slaves sit and go eat there and eat what I give you. So, but that's a little concern to think about over everything that Joseph had to do. He could have fallen into temptation. Joseph, Joseph could have done it, I guess, for the lack of a better term, right? And, and Mrs. Potiphar didn't care because, you know, Joseph was disposable. Joseph was a slave. Joseph could have been taken advantage of, and then she could have had him killed or sold off. She didn't care. So when it says that she talked to him time and time and time again, she was really trying to wear him down. But Joseph stood his ground. He stood his ground. Why? Because the Lord was with him. Joseph had another master to serve first. Joseph knew that God was blessing everything he was involved with. More importantly, because the Lord was with him, Joseph knew the differences between right and wrong. Mrs. Potiphar was wrong. Following God's will is right. Clearly, the Lord was not with Mrs. Potiphar. Joseph knew that what she wanted to do was a sin, and he wasn't about to sin against the God that had continually blessed and protected him so far. So even though the aggressive Mrs. Potiphar kept trying to wear down his defensive, Joseph stood his ground with strength under fire, or as I say, strength under pot of fire. Joseph was successful for about because of four characteristics in this story. And it led him through his life. We'll continue to see that. Joseph was strong because he was industrious and a good steward of what God had given him to take care of. His great devotion to his master, Potiphar, and his God, Yahweh. 
It's the second characteristic that made Joseph so successful. God's active presence in Joseph's life was the third thing that made him so successful. The Lord was with God. And the fourth and final thing is that God's sovereign help in Joseph's life and work made Joseph so successful. Even though Joseph had big problems, slavery, a wife of another person trying to snare him, these are big problems. He still had the Lord in his life. On Sunday mornings, there's a Christian kind of radio station that play, or a radio program that plays on B93, John Ritter, was it the Rise Up show? Mm -hmm. And his show always ends with a song, and there's a line in the song that says, don't tell God about your big, big problems. Tell your problems about your great, big God. And I love that because we hear something like that and we as Christians and followers of that great big God have so much to be thankful for. And we have so much to do this response of proper living and proper service to the Lord because of his grace in our lives. And it's a great big grace. God has given us opportunities to care for things on the earth that make up his wonderful creation, such as other humans, finances, family. I put that down, and that goes with other humans, of course, and of course, his church. In the last few weeks, we've been doing our, our statement of faith, and over the last couple of weeks, we've said some things that kind of show us and remind us that the church has that job in mind. It has the reason for us to be industrious stewards for God, such as grateful for the advances in science and technology, we participate in their development, fostering care for creation and respecting the gift of life. To serve, or we, sorry, we commit ourselves to honor all God's creatures and protect them from the abuse and extinction. For our world belongs to God. We're established by God. But we pray for our rulers. We work to influence government to make sure that even the government, who thinks they're too big sometimes, glorifies God in the things they do. But being Stewards of what God has given us is only a small portion of our grateful living. Being a devoted servant like Joseph to God, or like Joseph was to God, was huge. Because they could see by what he did and how he handled his business. Even though he was forced to give up his life in service to Potiphar. God deserves us to be willing to to serve. I, I wanted to use the word volunteer, but it even kind of goes a little bit more than volunteering. There's, there's a willingness in our hearts that we know that God has done so much for us, so it's time we give back. And when we give up our lives of service to God and devote our time to Him, God devotes Himself to us. Protecting us from evil, guiding us day to day so our lives glorify us. Because the Lord is with us. This is a means to an end, a time for us to take up service to glorify God. That's what we as the church do, that's what we as the Christian followers do, the means to an end, the chief end of man to glorify God in what we do. Eventually, Potiphar's wife got a chance to tell her husband what had happened. And what did she do? She lied about him. No surprise. If she's enough to cheat on her husband, 
But she had a pretty good story. Her husband believed her because Joseph was silly enough to leave his coat behind. She might have had a pretty good grip on it, but you know, she, he left it behind. He ran to get out of there. He did the right thing, and so she showed him this coat and said, oh, look what your servant did to make sport of me, as she said. Her husband believed her. Mrs. Pot Mr. Potiphar threw him in jail, threw him in a prison, and left him there. And for the final time in this chapter, we read what? We read that the Lord was with Joseph. So much that the warden put Joseph in charge of the inmates. In modern prison lingo, they call him a trustee. And that phrase comes from the word that he's technically a trustee. But other prisoners would call him a trustee. And he was to report on the things they do. He was to be in charge of them. He was basically taking care of the warden's house like he was doing for Potiphar. So for the next two years, Joseph was put in charge of the big house instead of Potiphar's house. And, and because the Lord was with him, the warden left him alone. If you, if you watch the movie Cool, it's Cool Hand Luke, where he's in prison, right? Yeah. That warden is a micromanager and the worst kind of individual. I can thankfully say, and, and Terry, you can, you can back me up, that our time helping out at the prison, we met wardens, if we met them, that were very, very nice guys. The warden at MTU, a place that was known because that's where Michigan would send their worst. Now they're sending their best because it's a great training place for them. A place where you couldn't have a toothbrush in your cell because you could make it into a weapon. Now these guys that are attending Calvin University for their bachelor's or associate's degree, they're allowed to have laptops in their cell. They're allowed to have all these things because the warden sees the good in it. And that's what Joseph had. The, Lord, the, the warden saw the good in Joseph. So he let Joseph be. He let Joseph serve his time as comfortable as he could, as you could in the prison, but he put him in charge. Our God will be with us because he's so great, amen? amen. And our God will be with us, his children, through anything. That phrase, the Lord is with us, that's something that keeps me personally going day to day when I wake up. And I may not get the protection or the guidance that I think should come as fast as it should. I'm an impatient prayer. I don't ever pray for patience because I get impatient waiting for it. But he's always with me. He's always with us. And we can remember that God's timing is perfect. Amen? Amen. I think in this Joseph story, it was important to know that God put it on the hearts to sell him to slave traders when just a moment before, they wanted just to kill him. God's timing is perfect. Doesn't make sense. Why couldn't God just change their hearts and make everybody get along? Why couldn't the 12 brothers just get along? There would be a 12th tribe, it'd be, or a 13th tribe, it'd be Joseph, but it didn't work out that way. Joseph's perfect timing took Joseph out of a pretty dangerous situation with his brothers and put him in Egypt. And we'll continue to go on as we go through. We'll, we'll see why that works out so well. But everything God does for us is for our benefit and for his glory. While planning a, an ending for this passage, Psalm 121, right in my head. How do I end this passage? Someone do it. And it wasn't so much the numbers, but it was the phrase, where does my strength come from? Is what popped in my head. Let me finish by reading Psalm 121. I lift up my eyes to the mountains. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. He will not let your foot slip. He who watches over you will not slumber. Indeed, he who watches over Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord watches over you. The Lord is your shade and your right hand, and the sun 
will not harm you by day nor the moon at night. The Lord will keep you from all harm. He will watch over your life. The Lord will watch over your coming and going both now and forevermore. the God of peace make you perfect and holy. Keep yourself blameless in spirit, body, and soul until the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Go in peace.